Will democracy survive the next couple of years? Essentially, we are the same. There are so many needs that Minnesota has. What people are saying they need right now. Access to Democracy is made possible in part by a donation from Firefly Credit Union. Firefly is the new name of U.S. Federal Credit Union, which has proudly served the financial needs of the greater Twin Cities community since 1925. At Firefly, we guide our members forward and give them the power to chase dreams by delivering the financial solutions they need to get ahead. From checking accounts to mortgages, we'll light the way. We are Firefly Credit Union, and this is life illuminated. By Thomson Reuters, providing legal professionals with intelligence, technology, and human expertise they need to find trusted answers. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. Online at ThomsonReuters.com. And Dr. Charles Crutchfield of award-winning Crutchfield Dermatology in Egan. Acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians, a Minnesota native who trained at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Crutchfield personally treats all patients and states that experience counts and quality matters. Crutchfield Dermatology, look good, feel great, with beautiful skin. Welcome, Access to Democracy Returns, Alan Miller with you as usual, and we have a return guest, very happy to have him, uh, Matt Goldman, who uh, certainly uh, is well known for his Emmy work and uh, for his authors uh, in terms of his Nils Shapiro books, which we'll talk about. And, but today we're going to talk about Matt Goldman, the, the newlywed. Uh, <laughs> well, not quite, but uh, yeah. we, we have a first anniversary coming up in, in October. October. Yes. And how's it going? Great. Great, we're going to make it. We're going to make it through October. If you make it through the first three months, I think it usually uh, is <laughs> okay. a good sign. Of course, with many of mine, I didn't. But, yeah, uh, all good so far. Sharon is a person of, uh, a person of great patience and wisdom, uh, <laughs> which keeps me on the straight and narrow. Good. So we have the newest Neil Shapiro book. Yeah. And uh, for those people who didn't catch our earlier show with you, uh, how did we come up with Nils Shapiro, the Minnesota detective? Well, uh, I took something from my own life, which is that uh, I'm Jewish, but I'm named after a Swede. Uh, when my dad was growing up, uh, his dad was friends with a Swedish immigrant named Matt Anderson. And, and he was like a, a second dad to my dad. Took him hunting and fishing. and spent a lot of time with him, and he died the day my parents got married, and so I'm named after him. And I like the little juxtaposition, especially since I'm a Minnesotan. Uh, but it's not so obvious. Who has recently returned to Minnesota. Yeah, I was in Los Angeles for quite a long time. Just sitting around, right. writing TV shows, getting uh, I often Emmys was, and I things often like was that. sitting when I wrote the TV shows, yeah. Um, and so I wanted to give Nils a name him uh, after a Swede, and and so I, uh, it's not, it's just not obvious with a name like Matt. So I, I went through my, my friends who have Swedish names like Pear and Leaf and Nils, and but Nils is what I really liked, and, and so, so that's what I chose. Yeah. Book three, book three, yeah, The Shallows, which is out now, mm -hmm. which is of course set in Minnesota. I don't know if all of them will be set in Minnesota, the but the fourth uh, book is done. Ah. Uh, which comes out next summer, and it starts, it, it's in Minnesota, but it's also in Los Angeles. Nils follows a, a subject out to Los Angeles. Locations, locations, locations. Yes. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I saw that you're going on a book tour, and you've been on a book tour, yeah. but you're doing one out of state, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I often go out of state uh, for different events. Uh, uh, I've, I've been to many other states. Uh, I, uh, I just finished the first leg of the Shallows book tour, and I was in California and Arizona. On the book that. has been very well received uh, mm -hmm. in terms of reviews, by the way. Yeah, it did. Very well received. It got starred reviews in Library Journal and Publishers Weekly, and uh, a really nice 
review and bookshelf as well as some local things well, as well. One of the things, I mean, because you were, I wouldn't say a comedy writer, but you mm -hmm. were a TV writer and, and basically you did some comedy shows. You can say comedy writer. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have a certain twist to uh, Neil Shapiro has a lot of your personality. He has and, my voice. And yeah. uh, here's what one reviewer said. Uh, for example, Minnetonka detective Mike Norton had light brown hair and a forehead so big you could rent it out as a billboard. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting because an analogy I used uh, in something I'm working on said that uh, he hated to have uh, barbecues, but when they finally talked him into bar buying one, he got a Weber as big as a uh, an aircraft carrier. <laughs> and uh, this yeah. made me think of that. Yeah, and no, Nils uh, has uh, a l observational skills, and he's kind of a witty observer. Uh, he narrates the stories. The stories themselves are not comedies. They're Darker mysteries. First person, which first person, I, I really, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoy first person. Uh, a Minnetonka bar had more TV sets, uh, more TVs than a Best Buy, and served more summer rum drinks than a pirate ship. <laughs> That's also right out of uh, the shallows. Yeah, and uh, there are a lot of other witticisms in it, but it opens not necessarily with a witticism. Correct. We find a lawyer floating by his dock with a fish hook through his jaw. It's actually a fishing stringer. A fishing stringer through, through his, his jaw. Through his jaw. And, and he's, uh, uh, that smarts, but he's dead, so he doesn't know. <laughs> yeah. It, it starts on Christmas Lake, which uh, uh, is just across Highway 7 from Lake Minnetonka, and a lawyer is found dead tied to his own dock with a fishing stringer through his jaw. Uh, you know, there's, there are these things called book trailers. They're like movie trailers, but for books. Right. And for my first two, I didn't have one. Uh, but they're becoming more popular again. And I thought, I'm this big TV producer. I'll make a book trailer for The Shallows. <laughs> uh, I can pull that off. And so I wanted to shoot that opening scene where the lawyer's found dead in his lake. But we had such a late spring. I had to keep waiting and waiting and waiting first for the ice to go off the lakes, but then for the water to get warm enough for somebody to go in it. And it just it and then to throw somebody in, kill them, and have them <laughs> right. float, uh, you know. But it never got warm enough, so we, were gonna, we had this person who was going to make a dummy, but at the last second, that didn't work out. And then my brother said, well, he had a wetsuit, so he could be the body. And then the night before we were going to shoot, he called me and said, uh, I can't find my wetsuit. <laughs> so I had to go to the, uh, a scuba shop and see if I could find someone to do it. But it was the day, it was Memorial Day weekend and no one was available. So I had to rent a, a wetsuit and be the dead body. So if you go to my website, mattgoldman.com or on YouTube, and you want to watch the book trailer for The Shallows, uh, the dead body floating by is me. <laughs> that's that, how good my producing skills that's are. That's an interesting and unique <laughs> story, yeah. Yeah, and it wasn't yeah. as cold as I thought it would be. But with your background in TV, yeah. uh, you decided to become a producer for this, which is a clever idea. Uh, most people wouldn't think of that. Yeah, uh, I, I, and I found a very talented uh, videographer in town, and uh, we put it together and made a nice little book trailer. Well, yeah. I haven't seen it yet, so I'll have to check that yeah. out. Yeah, please I've, do. I've read quite a few of the reviews, uh, mm -hmm. which which are really very, very good, and obviously the book is doing well. Yeah. And uh, the uniqueness of the character. So here we have this dead lawyer floating. Right. Uh, his wife wants to have Nils represent her. Yeah. Uh, everybody else wants Nils to represent her. We have so many conflicts of interest here along the way as this thing gets more and more convoluted leading up to a surprise ending. Yeah, each book is different. And what I found was, you know, I don't plan them out because I, I find when you do that, you end up 
pigeonholing characters, you know, pushing them into places that you want them to fit to make the story work. But I write them more from the inside out so that the characters always remain true and then I just have to make sure the story works. But in this book it really felt organic for a bunch of different characters to want to hire Nils, that they had interests that they wanted represented by a private detective. And they were and all nervous about their involvement or possible involvement in this death. Yeah, in this case, slash murder. I'm not really giving anything away because it happens in the beginning, but the new widow of the murder victim wants to hire Nils because she's been having an affair and she knows that she and her boyfriend will be suspects in the murder case. And uh, she wasn't grieving too much to begin with. No, they ha their, their marriage was on the outs. Yeah. Been there, done that, yeah. fortunately, <laughs> way back. But, but at least you lived through it. Yes. This poor guy, Todd, did not. Well, <laughs> if it had been up to my first wife, I wouldn't necessarily, but we won't go into that. <laughs> Uh, so, the average working day yeah. for Matt Goldman starts how? I'm, I wake up in the fours usually, very early, uh, and I get some coffee and I start working and I pretty much work, well I'll work from about 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. and then I'll take my dogs out for an hour and then I'll come back and work till lunch and a couple hours after lunch, and I'm pretty much done by mid-afternoon. Which gives you the afternoon and the evening, uh, certainly, for yourself. Yeah, and, but, and I'm always still thinking during those times. I'm just not at the keyboard. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're just a writer working by yourself, you never have to go to meetings, and that frees up so much time for me to work. As, uh, op as opposed to your television life, which oh, yeah. was meetings, 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 and as long a, days, yeah, six a, days a, a week at least. It, yes, and it's opposed to a lot of people's lives. They're, they're in meetings and things. And I find that if you don't have to go to meetings, it really increases your productivity. Do you ever find that you're sitting there uh, in a chair with mm -hmm. your eyes closed and your wife says to you, as mine does to me, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm thinking about something I'm writing. Does that happen to you? Well, there's been a lot of conversations. Uh, this is uh, when we met and we started spending more time together, I explained to Michelle that there's a lot of times I'm working when it looks like I'm not working. Because uh, uh, I think for a creative person, you need to create space for yourself. And some of that's typing words onto a page, and some of it's giving yourself space to daydream and creating environments where ideas can come. And it looks like the creative person is being extremely lazy. <laughs> it has the appearance of laziness. You can get away with a lot that way. You too, can though. get away <laughs> with a lot. And, uh, but a lot of it for me is uh, going for a walk or, or doing something that doesn't seem to be to, to require much. Uh, Walking with the dogs is good for uh, thinking about. It uh, is. Yeah. Walking in general is good. Those kind of, uh, when you have a simple task, it kind of frees up my brain for ideas to come. And so we're done by 12, 1 o'clock or so? When we yeah, have... it's 2 or 3 o'clock. I'm usually done by the day. And then uh, I'll go play squash often for a couple hours and get some exercise, and then I'm done. And a day's output in terms of words or mm -hmm. pages could be what? Uh, in the very beginning, I start slower with 500 to 1,000 words. But once I get ramped up, within a few weeks, I'm 1,500 to 2,000 words a day. But the seven days a week. The average novel being what, about 80,000 mm -hmm. words? So once I get going, they, they come relatively quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sitting with something that's 110,000 words, so one has a lot of editing to do. Yeah, I mean, 100, if, if, it, if there are 110,000 great words, it's, it's fine. But no, they're, I my, know they're my words. So. <laughs> Publishers often want them shorter than that. Yeah. Yeah, because mm -hmm. they want readers to not have to invest in such a thick novel unless they're already dedicated fans of that author. I also respect the fact that you're writing one book a year. <clears throat> we have a lot of writers now 
uh, or two things. One we talked about before we went on the air right. is somebody who will lend his name to somebody else, like Patterson, yeah. who probably has six other writers. At least. Because uh, I know books, three of them. <laughs> yeah, so. Doing books in his yeah. name that he will put his name on James Patterson, but then you go down and as written by. Yeah, a and, lot of uh, big authors do that. Uh, Clive Cussler does it. Um, there, there are a few. And there are mm -hmm. some, and it happens posthumously that the estate hires a writer to write right, for right. Robert B. Parker or even Conan Doyle. Or yeah. right here in uh, many, um, St. Paul, uh, the writer who died two years ago. Oh, Vince Flynn. Yeah, yeah. Vince. And yep. Vince uh, has uh, somebody else writing a book now. Yeah, well, they're, they become brands, those yeah, writers, yeah. Uh, and, at uh, a certain point. Uh, it's, it's interesting. There, there are very few of them that mm -hmm. I will read. Uh, now the Ludlam books were just taken over uh, by Brian Freeman. By yes. Brian, and uh, who's on here frequently. Great. And <clears throat> that I will read because I know the quality of his writing. Yes. And the quality of his writing is outstanding. So uh, that's a book I will read. As this book, which was already read by myself and part of the staff here yeah. and my wife, is well, good. <clears throat> and. Uh, all, all the same book, we pass it around. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, instead of, uh, so what about We book can get tours? you as many copies as you want. <laughs> <laughs> what about the book tours? Do you enjoy the book tours or not? Because a I, lot of people say they're burdensome. They're, I wouldn't say they're burdensome. They're, uh, they take some time, but I do enjoy connecting with readers in person. And now that, I mean, I've been a, professional published author for only two years. This is the third book that came out. The first one was two years ago. Uh, so now I'm starting to, to meet write, readers uh, second and third time. And I do enjoy getting to know them and hearing what they think. But and don't send me any of your ideas for books. Well, I'm not looking for ideas for or books. Or don't send yeah. me any attachments to critique <laughs> what you have written. No, I mean, if, if people, uh, when I get to know people, I, I'm often willing to, to help, help in any way I can, because uh, people did it for me when I was starting out. Um, I'll have 30 pages to you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it's, uh, but book tours are, uh, some, some events are better than others, but, but for the most part, I don't mind doing those things. Uh, I, you know, I sit by myself all day long and write. So getting out there in the world isn't a terrible thing. It helps uh, as a writer if you're schizophrenic because then you at least have yourself to keep company. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't think I'm schizophrenic, but I, but I am introverted, uh, qu quite introverted. Well, that's yeah. interesting because yeah. you, one wouldn't think it with uh, your background in terms of the writing that you have done both for television yeah. and all? It's a, a lot of performers are introverts, especially stand-up comedians and actors. A lot until of, you put them out there. Until you put them out there. And then all introversion means is that you, you kind of recharge by being alone. It doesn't mean you don't have social skills. Now, your wife is a professional also. She's a marriage and family therapist. Mm -hmm. That's not how we met, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. So she has her own profession. Yeah. Uh, which takes her part of the time, uh, probably not the same time that you're working. She's probably not got appointments at four in the morning. No, she doesn't, but there's definitely overlaps in our day where we're both working. Yeah. And uh, that's working out, though. Yeah, very well. Now we have another book coming out a year from now. And as I said, I respect people that put out one book a year and don't try to really write two, three, four, because yeah. I think sometimes it can really tap on your creativity a little mm -hmm. bit too much. Well, what's, what's the next Neil Shapiro gonna be? The next one's called Dead West, and a very wealthy family in St. Paul on Summit Avenue, uh, an elderly couple, their, their grandson has just turned 30 and received his trust fund and he's moved out to LA and they're worried 
he's going to throw away his millions investing in show business. So they send Nils out to L.A. to, to check into it. And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in Los Angeles, and, and I never quite felt I fit in there. And I always felt like an outsider. And so I wanted to send Nils to L.A. so he could describe Los Angeles and show business uh, somewhat through my eyes. And, and, uh, a jaundiced view? or uh, a Well, it's, it's, it's just a different view. You know, a lot of my books, a big part of them is Minnesota nice. And Minnesota nice is a real thing. I don't know if people are actually nicer, but I think people act nicer. Oh, I think they are. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think that's one of the problems that Amy Klobuchar is having in her well, presidential Well, that very well might be. She is just too laid back. She's, she's not what some of these other candidates have done in terms of being killers. Well, it is a part of our culture in Minnesota that you don't make noise and you don't try to stick up about, uh, ahead of everybody else. It's also part of our culture you don't want to fall behind. And I think the movie Fargo is very much about that. That's a character who was falling behind and got in trouble, so he acted desperately to try to catch back up. But and and part of part of what Nils deals with in Minnesota is, I think in Gone to Dust, the first book, he says something like, uh, "Minnesotans, we're not tough-talking people. It doesn't work here. We have to sand off our rough edges and play nice." And that's very much true. He's not a tough talking guy. He doesn't get in fights. It just is that kind of show of force isn't respected here. But when he goes to LA, he finds things are different. So he has to make an adjustment. And I want or get swallowed up. Or get or get swallowed up or have or just be completely ineffective. Mm -hmm. And so uh I I use the difference in the two subcultures to show that with him. It's interesting. And did you feel in your own persona that you had to do that in L.A.? Yeah, and it wasn't natural for me. I just don't have that. I'm not a big noisemaker. I don't want attention drawn to myself. And that, I had a great career as a TV writer, but I would have had a different career uh, if I was more of that personality type. Did you live in L.A. itself? or did Yes. You, you did? Yeah. And L.A. is huge. Yes, it when is. When you hear things about neighborhoods like Studio City or uh, uh, Hollywood or um, uh, Venice Beach, that's all Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. That's all part of the city of Los Angeles. So it's a big place. There is a downtown area, but it's hardly the center of anything. It's just a place with tall buildings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The place that you spend the most time is probably sitting on the 405. <laughs> but, uh, well, I always try to uh, avoid that at all costs. So uh, um, that's, I tended to live close to where I worked. Yeah. Yeah, their, their tendency there is just to uh, sit and sit and sit. It's, uh, yeah, it just amazing. keeps getting worse and worse. I first went there in 1987 <clears throat> and thought it was bad, and it's infinitely worse now. Well, we might have a Dodgers uh, Twins World Series this year. I would year. love that. That would be yeah. very interesting. Who would you be rooting for? I would be rooting for the Twins, no doubt about yeah. it. But the Dodgers are my National League team. Yeah. Uh, but I am a diehard Twins fan, and this year has been terribly exciting. It certainly has yeah. been, having lived through uh, many sad years, yes. uh, difficult years with the Twins uh, since we moved here 23 years yeah. ago. And when the Yankees would come into the old Metrodome, it was like uh, the poor kids uh, sat there while the bus pulled up with the rich kids. I know. The Yankees still terrify me. Well, I don't. they've also still got a uh, payroll twice the size of oh. ours. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, I mean, not to talk baseball too much, but, but the division leaders in the American League, Houston and the Yankees, are, are two fantastic teams. Yes, so, they are. But I, I love Baldelli, and I love what's happen, happening with 
everybody seems to be contributing on the Twins yeah. this year, and it's very exciting. Well, we've spent a lot of time on this show with the Twins mm -hmm. and preseason and during the season, not recently during the season, but uh, and uh, Dave St. Peter has been very much oh, great. Of, of our preseason guests mm -hmm. where we talk about the upcoming year, or John Steves, the team physician, uh -huh. things like that, and uh, I can name many, many. And, yeah. Uh, By the way, in this book, uh, Nils goes, uh, he has some time to kill downtown, so he goes and buys a ticket outside Target Field and sits in there for four or five innings. Uh, so I, I, I just wanted to pay a little tribute to Target Field. I think it's one of the most beautiful places it is. in it's professional a, sports. It, it's a great venue, yeah. and even though they're in uh, Cleveland this weekend for a big series. Very big series. Very big. Yeah. So we got to okay. set, that, set that right. <laughs> so what else would you like to share with your burgeoning group of readers? Well, I've just completed a novel that's going to go out to publishers, a uh, historical novel set in 1922. Really? Called Cathedral Hill. And like the name implies, it's, it's centered in St. Paul. And it's uh, about uh, uh, some adult brothers who owned a liquor store and lost it to Prohibition. And it's about their lives two years later. Uh, there's some crime in it, because I want to stay in the genre, but it's not about bootleggers and crime and things. There's some of that in there. And it's not a Neil Shapiro. And it's not a Neil Shapiro book. So well, that, That'll be an interesting diversion. Yeah, I got quite ahead in, <clears throat> in my deadlines with the Nils books. The fourth book is already done. So I wrote this book, and uh, I hope it finds a home. Cathedral Hill. Yes. Yeah, so maybe next time I'm back, we can talk about where, where that will be. Absolutely. And, yeah. uh, now, is this where you have to search for a publisher because it's not your publisher? It may or, end up at my publisher. No one's seen it yet. Ah. I wanted to just write it and not try to sell it unwritten. Uh, part of the reason is, is because I don't know enough until it's written uh, that that process happens in the writing. Nonfiction books are often sold uh, on a chapter or two in a book proposal. But fiction books, it's difficult to do that. And it does happen, but then there's someone asking me for pages and things, and I want to work at my own pace. So we'll, we'll see what, how well, it's received. That should be interesting. We'll look forward to that one. Yeah, I enjoyed writing it. And, I hope it uh, finds a home. Yeah, yeah I, I'm sure it will. <laughs> just based on the quality of the writing that we have seen oh, so far. Oh, thank you very much. And the background that we have uh, obviously looked on your mantelpiece and seen the Emmys and things like that. Yeah. Well, I learned a lot about writing when I was in Hollywood. So not everything applies to books, but, but a lot of it does. Matt Goldman, author supreme, <laughs> thank you so much. And, thank you, uh, Alan. It's always a pleasure. Come back with Nils or with the new one, Cathedral Hill. I will. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Door is always open for Matt Goldman. <laughs>